I now give the floor to Mr. Martin Griffiths. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <coughs> um, Mr. President, as you hear every month, and as we have just heard from Gare, the humanitarian crisis in the Syrian Arab Republic continues to worsen. And each month, accordingly, you hear the emergency relief coordinator, that's me, say this, and yet without a change of course, each month this will remain true. And my, as my uh, role is to bear witness in this council to the su suffering of the Syrian people, so, Mr. President, I hope you will bear with me. Ten years into the conflict, life remains very difficult for millions of Syrians, as we've just been hearing from Gare. It is increasingly more difficult for many of them. Violence continues to kill and injure civilians, including women and children. Attacks and security incidents increased throughout Syria this month, only last week. An attack in Ariha in the Idlib governorate reportedly killed 11 civilians and injured over 30, including school children. A market supported by a UN project was also damaged. And all parties to the conflict, again, as Gare has said, must respect civilians and civilian infrastructure as is required by international humanitarian law and make all effort to spare them the consequences of conflict. Mr. President, daily life in Syria, thus, is becoming less and less affordable. Over 90% of the population now lives below the poverty line. Many people are forced to make very difficult choices to make ends meet and thus face greater risk of exploitation. And this means that an expansion of early recovery programs must be central in our efforts to address needs in a sustainable way. Progress has been made, but along with other mechanisms, our pooled funds have increased support to early recovery activities, but much, much, much more is needed. I will continue for my part to urge donors, agencies, and implementing partners to enable communities to access basic social services and to rebuild dignified lives. Mr. President, on top of increasing poverty, the water crisis and worsening food security, people in Syria are also facing a resurgence of COVID-19. Cases are surging, ICUs are at full capacity, and vaccination rates remain below 2%. 2%, Mr. President. And now exhausted by years of conflict, poverty, and the pandemic, Syrians are about to face another bitter winter. And as temperatures start to drop, rain, cold, and winter conditions will compound hardship for millions of people, close to two million people in the Northwest, for example, mostly women and children, live in camps, often in overcrowded and flimsy shelters, in valleys that flood, or on rocky hillsides exposed to the elements and they have lived there for some time, these temporary arrangements. And although the United Nations and its humanitarian partners are doing everything possible to assist the most vulnerable, significant funding gaps remain. Mr. President, the UN and its partners <clears throat> continue to make every effort as required by this council to scale up assistance. And uh, I, when I was in Aleppo last August, when the world, I was there when the World Food Programme's cross-line delivery of food aid reached Idlib governorate. This was a vital step towards expanding the humanitarian response. But we must now ensure that aid, that aid is distributed. And as I speak, full agreement from the parties remains pending. And I would urge swift movement to those withholding such agreement on next steps. Preparations are also underway for another World Food Programme cross-line delivery in November. And beyond this, the United Nations has developed a plan for a series of regular and predictable interagency cross-line operations to deliver multi-sectoral assistance in the coming six months and to complement the assistance coming across the border. We have already submitted the request for the first interagency convoy under the six-month plan to the government of Syria. And the support of both the Syrian and Turkish governments 
and relevant parties in northwest Syria for the plan will also be critical. I'm quietly optimistic that we will be able to further expand cross-line access over the coming months. And you can be sure that we will certainly do our part. I urge, therefore, all concerned parties to ensure that cross-line missions and the aid distributions that are associated with them proceed without delays. If cross-line operations are to be a sustainable way of reaching more people, then we need agreement on a suitable distribution modality that is acceptable to all the relevant parties and security guarantees from parties on the ground. And Mr. President, this is a complicated matter. Uh, it takes time, but it has all our efforts. Mr. President, when it comes to delivering life-saving aid, all channels should be made and kept available. And thus, as I mentioned earlier, cross-border assistance remains the central part of the humanitarian response to, re to ensure aid effectively and transparently reaches, reaches millions of people in need in northwest Syria. Mr. President, constructive discussions with the Syrian authorities have shown that previous mission approval rates have been misrepresented, including in at least one previous report of the Secretary General, and I apologize for this, and I assure you that through our cooperation with the government, we'll make every effort to prevent this in the future. So, Mr. President, to sum up, communities are determined to restart their lives, yet still face so many difficulties. What is needed is this. We need an urgent injection of life-saving aid, especially as Syrians prepare for winter. We need more aid to early recovery and livelihoods. Syrians want to be able to support themselves with dignity. And we need to expand access to basic social services. Syrians, like all of us, want to send their children to school, to have electricity and water, and a reliable health clinic. That is the least that we can help them to, to achieve. And of course, perhaps most importantly, Syrians need peace and the support for the efforts of the Special Envoy. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Mr. Griffiths for his briefing.